welcome back to the House of the Stack podcast. Today we're joined by Fabian Wagner, cinematographer of both Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon, also the Justice League. So happy to have you, Fabian. How's it going? Hi, guys. Yeah, good. Very good. Thank you. Just um, just got back home after a week of traveling, so I'll see you back. Well, then let's start with the very first question. All right, so um, Fabian, how how do you make sure that your sort of vision as a cinematographer stays consistent during uh, post production? You know, color grading, all of that um, on a on a big scale production like you know Game of Thrones or uh, House of the Dragon or whatever it should be. You know, there are so many people involved um, in post. So, is there sort of uh, as you've gone on, is that have you sort of learned how to sort of speak to people and how to make sure your your word gets in? Well, you know, that's a really good question. But Game of Thrones and House of Dragon, respectively, were really easy when it came to that. I've had many issues in the past on on other projects. Where, um, you know, because as cinematographers, sometimes you can't be involved in the DI and the great because you have a different job at that time. You know, that normally happens six, seven, eight months down the line. So I'm working on a different uh, job, and so I physically can't be there. And then you have to very much rely on uh, the people in there to, to do what you intended or set out to do. And I've had problems with that before, where I wasn't able to attend the grade, and, and you know, things were changed drastically to, you know, on, on a couple of projects to to a degree that was really, you know, kind of um, well, not not good for the project and, and quite, you know, painful <laughs> for myself. Um, on Game of Thrones, it's something that you or I never, and I think none of us ever had to worry about, you know, the Everybody from, you know, the showrunners to production to the colorists or the one colorist with one colorist who's doing the whole whole show and all the, all the seasons, you know, everybody understood um, what that show was about, what the look was of that show, even though all of us made it look slightly different, but we all... You know, I think all the DPs on that show, you know, contributed to the look of, of Game of Thrones. And um, it was just understood from the very top of how that sh how important that is for the show. And so Game of Thrones literally was probably the only show I've ever worked on where I never had to even think about worrying, you know. It leads us to the second one. Um... What's the most difficult thing about working on a show where dragons uh, fight dragons? You know, big battles are bound to happen. So how does that process of bringing it from the page to the screen go? Uh, well, it's a lot of, um, you know, on those kind of shows, especially with David and Dan and then also House of Dragon, you know, the ambitions are huge. Uh, and a lot of the times the ambitions are bigger than what we can actually physically do or financially achieve or within the time that we have. And I think a lot, of, you know, but it's great to have those big ambitions because, you know, you want to reach as high as you can. And so I loved it about David and Dan. And so, but, you know, we had to go into every episode and sort of be like, okay, this is what they want and we want to give them that. But to make it achievable, we have to, you know, cut certain things, change certain certain things. And um, so I think, you know, that's a big challenge is is really to figure out what we can do within the time and the money that you've been given, you know, and make it as big and as, uh, as you know, as good as possible. Battle of the Bastards is a great example because the script that I initially read that Miguel and I were given was twice the size of what what turned out to be and it was frankly just unachievable you know um and so we kind of you know made it into what it was and and, and hoping and trying for that to be achievable and thankfully it worked it certainly hasn't become any easier um with so many dragons involved now right i mean 
They haven't started <laughs> battling each other yet. Not yet. I think that's going to come soon. <laughs> no, it just takes a bit of imagination, and you need to have a good relationship with the original effects team. Mm. You know, you, you know, you break down what you want to do. You, you, you know, it's just a bit of prep, really. It's not, it's not, not rocket science. So on on something like like Game of Thrones and House of Dragon, I I know like you're you're working with massive sets, you know, uh, like the throne room for example. It, it's it's colossal, you know, most larger than what most people will ever work on, you know. So how how do you approach lighting a scene like that when you're you know practical lighting can only take you so far, you know, you have to sort of play around with the visuals and and sort of work around a scale like that how do you even start well i mean you know you know light i always say i mean lighting is always the same right whether i have three uh iphones and that's my key light and that's my backlight and that's my fill light right the principle stays the same you just, you know, in a set like that, you do it on a much bigger scale. But really, it's the same principle. So, you know, I I remember walking into the throne room the first time of season four. I said this many times before, and I really, literally, I was like, fucking hell, I have no idea, you know, what to do here because it's so big. And it was scary. But uh, at the same time, you know, you're surrounded by a good, by a good team. I had a good gaffer who was, you know, by my side and you know you figure it out and in the end you know really when you break it down it's just a very simple setup you know we had those big windows you know that sort of generated our sunlight coming in you know and it's not an iphone in this case it's a 20k you know but they all do the same thing so so I, i'm assuming you guys probably use those those inflatable pads outside the outside the windows like balloons, you mean? Yeah. No, didn't use balloons on that occasion. Sometimes that happens, but no, because you're on a stage and, you know, you, they normally put up a truss, you know, and then you hang the lights off it and then you pull them up in the air and that sort of generates a soft, a soft light. Uh. Um, but you wouldn't use a balloon probably in there for over the duration of time just for practical reasons. Because they um they do the roof of the throne room in post anyway, right? So you can sort of play around with that a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no ceiling on that. Mm. And the next one, um, how do you balance your personal style of shooting versus what the director or producer wants it to look like? Well, that very much depends on what you do. You know, if you... I mean, I believe that all cinematographers have their own sort of style, you know, we all have our own thing, no matter how minuscule or, you know, different it may be, but, you know, I mean, hopefully one of the reasons why you get a job is because people like your style, whatever that is. Um, you know, and I think it's quite, e you know, I don't even know what my style is. But I know all the things that I like, you know, I like, I know the things that I like visually, like silhouettes and like um, darkness, you know, and reflections, you know. So there's all these things that, you know, I get drawn to. And so they kind of reflect themselves in what I do, I hope, or I suppose. Um, but, you know, when you come onto a TV show, for example, on the second or the third block or, you know, after someone else, you know, you kind of also have to fall into, you know, the realm and the look of what that show is all about. So when I started Game of Thrones, you know, that was season four. People were very happy with the way the show looked and there was no need to change the look. You know, it was just just about in a very subtle way, put on your own kind of style, you know. But in a way that it still fits within the whole show. Yeah. Um. So I um I did a short film 
uh, a few months ago. And it was my first one, and I lit and shot it at myself. Um, and by far the biggest lesson that I learned is to shoot more than you need. Um, because editing without footage is an absolute nightmare. Um, so that's that's sort of the the key lesson that I learned on that. What what for you is a is there a sort of key lesson that you've learned uh, in your years that you can say really does stand out? I just did a short film a few months a few months ago, and it was the first one I'd done in quite a long time, and I loved it. And we actually shot very precisely to what the director wanted. She was very clear about what she needed and what she wanted. And uh, I had a different experience. I loved it. I was like, fucking hell, this is great. I haven't been doing this stuff for ages. Um, so, you know, I mean, it very much depends on how a director works. You know, I've worked with, I mean, look, for example, let's say Miguel, right? Miguel is a great director because he knows exactly what he wants. But he's also a director who does like coverage and what i always find fascinating with miguel is that we shoot a lot of coverage we shoot a lot of different angles sometimes even to the point where i'm like do we really need this and i would say that to him but he's such an amazing creative director make that when he gets to the editing he actually takes all of this footage and he makes something really extraordinary with that. Uh, I think the other example would be that sometimes I think when you have too much coverage and it's not in the right hands, it can get completely cut to shreds and you lose the essence of the scene, you know? So, I think it's a very double-sided sword. I think on the one hand, yes, it's great to have the coverage if you have a very good, if you have a director who understands how to handle that. I think. Eona, That's what I'm trying. Eona talked about this that there were a lot of of not not necessarily whole scenes, but shots that ended up uh, not making the cut for the big wedding scene in House of the Dragon season one. So yeah, um, yeah, you know, you have to, yeah. And the other interesting thing is, you know, I always. You know, in the beginning, I didn't quite understand the whole thing. And I always got really angry at directors for over covering a scene. And then I realized that, especially when you do TV, right? You do a TV show, you do an episode, which is, let's say, 45 minutes long. If you <laughs> have a four minute scene and you cover it very sparsely, you're going to find yourself in a tricky position because you might not be able to cut that scene down in length if your episode is too long, right? So you, if you have good coverage, you can take a four minute scene and you can cut it down to a minute and you can keep the essence of that scene. If you don't have the coverage, you can't, which means you then have to probably lose the whole scene. So, you know, I do appreciate, you know, that coverage and, and, and stuff is very positive, but I think it needs to be in the right hands. I think especially when you're working on something that has these, uh, you know, when you have hundreds of extras in the room, you really, really want to make sure you have everything you could possibly need because, I mean, it's not something you can just reshoot, you know, it's not just going on location, getting two actors and doing it again, you know, it's it's a lot of money that you're just, you know. It's how much money you have. Justice League reshots for 50 days, I think. We're going to talk wow. about that later on as well. We have a big fan. Uh, we have a few fan questions. A big fan of your um, of your work on Justice League. Um, but yet, yeah, to continue with Game of Thrones, if there was one shot, one single shot you could have done differently on Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon, which one would it be and why? Differently. I mean, there's probably lots of shots that would have done differently. Oh, you can... Um, we're all ears. Well, you know, I actually can't... I couldn't... I don't think I could pick one out. I didn't expect that question. <laughs> I thought, which one's your favorite shot? That is coming later on as well. <laughs> uh, you know, I really actually... I, you know, 
I really can't. I, I don't actually know. I don't actually know. I think all the shots that we've done, which are in the show, are there for a reason, and it's probably something that I thought on the day. That's the right thing to do. All right. Then the next one. Um, during the later seasons of Game of Thrones, the show adopted a more cinematic look. Was this a conscious decision, or did it evolve naturally? When you say during later seasons, I mean, I think that look got developed in season two. Mm. I think that's when it really started. There were some amazing VPs on season two uh, with Kramer, Morgan Tau, and others. And um, I think they really set sort of a standard for that show, you know, which all of us afterwards sort of just, we could take that and then build on that, but I don't think it actually changed much after that. Mm. Um, you know, we were, we were able, you know, it's a show that just gives you lots of freedom, you know, and because you have these big sets and you have big locations, you know, you can do big cinematic shots, which is, um, which is a real pleasure, you know? Um, so this is now pre-production. So while you're busy sort of reading and analyzing the scripts and thinking about how you're doing it, what, what do you think is the most important thing that you really think about when you're you know storyboarding and sort of planning everything out with the directors and and the producers and all of that i mean it depends on the kind of job you're doing you know if i do a big job like game of thrones or something you know something that can be very intricate and where there's lots of different elements like you know these battle sequences and stuff you know i think when i it is, of course, a creative process, but the creative process kind of gets overshadowed by logistical issues. You know, how are you going to make this scene work if you have, what do we do if you have 500 extras, 60 horses, 60 stunt riders, 90 stuntmen, you know, four cameras, and we have this much to shoot in a day, and we only have eight hours of sunlight. It becomes much more of a, logistical thing and you know there's more you know the creative thing goes really quick it also depends who you work with you know when i work with Miguel, you know we almost we kind of know each other so well we're on the same wavelength we, we very little speak creatively because we're actually both subconsciously already know what the other one thinks mm. you know it's a real bonus and it's a real great thing so we can focus on the big logistical problems but then, you know, if you do a smaller film or something that's much more actors driven in, you know, less locations, smaller locations, you know, then, then you just focus on just on the creative thing because there isn't that many logistical things to sort out. Hi. Um, the next one is... Will you return for House of the Dragon Season 2 or future Game of Thrones projects? Let me check my watch. <laughs> but they started shooting, uh, I think, about a month ago or six weeks ago, and I'm not there. So no. Well, we, it, they're shooting until October or November, so it's not too late. I feel like no, there's a... The way, the way we shoot Game of Thrones and the way we also shoot House of Dragon is that we're shooting consecutively. Everyone's shooting at the same time. Mm. So, no, I can, I can openly say I'm not there. Ah. And would you return? Never say never. But right now, I'm quite happy to be doing something else that doesn't... Something that doesn't involve firelight and candlelight and flambeaux and moonlight. Right now, I'm enjoying fluorescence and modern light bulbs and modern looks. Oh, and by the way, that is, um, Julian Lewis John yeah. Jones talked about this. It's really hot in, in the front room because all, everything is it's really burning. So, yeah. Who's that? Julian Lewis Jones, who played Bormund, Raffian, yeah. said that it was really, really hot in, in the front room. Yeah. I'm sweating. It's a lot of light. Yeah. Right? Um, but anyway, um, let's get to the fan questions, Josh. Okay, so uh, Christoph asks, 
Uh, the cinematography in TV and film is becoming darker. Uh, is that a view of managing the CGI budget in post, or is it a creative choice? I mean, it's certainly a creative choice. What, what was the beginning of the question? Is it is it a, is it what in the CGI budget? Um, is it manage managing the CGI budget in post? So sort of hiding, sort of. Uh, smaller details and stuff like that by using darkness, I assume. Yeah. No. I mean, it's, you know, I would say most of the time it's, it's not that. Uh, it's obviously a creative choice. And, you know, if you look at films like The Batman, you know, Greg did such an amazing job on that film. And, um, I was blown away by the film when people were complaining it was dark. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not the right person to speak to about darkness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um, there was that backlash, right, for season eight, obviously. Um, just uh, if, if you, um, if you um, can talk about it, how did that make you feel when, you know, all those night shoots and, and everything that you guys your whole everything into it um how did that make you feel when you know all the backlash happened well i'm not going to talk about it much because i've talked about it enough i think mm. in the last few years but um i mean look the only thing i can say is obviously i i we or i didn't want to upset anyone you know we we wanted to make the show the way that we thought was the best way for that particular episode and hopefully people would have seen the blu-ray by now <laughs> if they're really big fans and you would have seen that you saw everything that you need to see you know i had death threats over that now that's ridiculous that's insane that's insane oh. um yeah fandom fandoms nowadays um yeah it's uh it's crazy i'm sorry I'm sorry for you had to go through that, man. No, I mean, it's... Okay, so the next one uh, from The Dragon Demands. Um, could you talk about the decision uh, not to apply uh, warm or cold filters in House of the Dragon, like in Game of Thrones? Um, I'm assuming this is sort of the general approach to sort of more color um, in House of the Dragon. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, obviously Miguel and I had done four seasons of Game of Thrones. We do the show really well. Uh, and and when we started House of Dragon, I said to Miguel, look, if, if I come into House of Dragon, I do really want to try and, and evolve it from what we've done for the last four or five years, you know. And so we started talking about how can we keep the Game of Thrones look, but but evolve it and make it give it its own look, give it, give it the House of the Dragon look. And so, and so that's how that came about. But also, you know, Game of Thrones was set in a... Game of Thrones is a, is a, is a show of like, what, 80, 87, 86 episodes, right? Mm. With loads of different characters, loads of different locations. And it was, it was a very clever thing to do of the guys in the beginning to differentiate different locations by color. So the North became cold, Westeros became warm. So when you switched on the TV, you know, even halfway through, and you see a scene, you know immediately, okay, this is in that part of the world, this is in this part of the world. You know, so the color scheme became a sort of map, you know. Um, but obviously we also didn't need that in, in um, House of the Dragon because it was mainly set in the warmth. I think it's it's quite interesting just um off of that I not not talking about Game of Thrones specifically but a lot of sort of medieval movies or or shows or whatever they they usually just sort of throw a sort of gray filter over everything for some reason um which is very strange to me because you know it's it's still the same planet you know we didn't we didn't go to a different planet we still you know people in the middle ages used so much color and um you know in heraldry and clothing and all that 
Um, and I'm very glad that House of the Dragon sort of took this very colorful approach. You know, you can really feel that sort of attention to detail um, in uh, just the colors. It's it's pretty yeah, impressive. It was a time of decadence, and I think um, you know that was probably a big inspiration, right? There's a lot of people put a lot of effort into it, and I thought the costumes were amazing. You know, the set design's amazing, and we wanted to reflect that. So, but well, you did a great job. Um, Next one is coming from House of the Dragon, Croatia. Um, we kind of went into it, but she is asking, any chance you and Miguel would return for House of the Dragon for an episode or two? Um, she said, obviously, yes, right? And the next one is... <laughs> Let's see. And the next one is, what are your favorite shots from the episodes you've worked on? In House of the Dragon or in general? Uh, in House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones. Well, I think I'd have to say it was Game of Thrones, I guess. I mean, actually, I like, I like Rhaenyra's close-up at the very end of episode one of House of Dragon, when she's, like, center-framed, and, and the episode finishes on her close-up. And then there's a scene earlier <clears throat> in the beginning where she meets Matt's character <clears throat> after a long time, and he's sitting on the throne. And she walks into the empty throne room mm. and it's sort of hidden in the shadows on the throne room and he leans forward into the light. Uh, and that, that was an idea that I didn't, I came up with that on the day when we were watching the rehearsals in the morning. I just said to me, wouldn't it be nice if he sort of leant forward into the light and then we see him for the first time. You know, it's things like that, I think. And then, you know, you know, thankfully, I've had the privilege of working on, on shows like that where it's kind of easy to make good shots, you know, like, you know, Game of Thrones gives you so much scope and, you know, set design and 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 things in the frame that, that just make it easy. Well, one of my favorite shots, I think, in Game of Thrones was pre the battle in, in Bob is where, oh, what's his name now? Where Liam's character is sort of, he finds the, the, the burned Oh yes, girl. I, was, I was about to say that. That's also one of my favorites. The one where he finds the, uh, the stag that she carved mm -hmm. for him. Beautiful, beautiful. Know, we, I, the sunrise in the back, out. right? Well, it was, mm -hmm. it was sunset actually, ah. but it was a very, it was, I had it all planned, but it was a terrible day. It was very cloudy and misty, and there was no sunset whatsoever. I wanted to shoot sunset for sunrise. And then so I just put a couple of 18 case behind that little brow and, put, and warmed them up and put some smoke in the air. And it, they kind of lit up the smoke and it kind of created that scene. And it, so that's, I think, one of my favorite shots. Yeah, yeah it's a beautiful shot. Beautiful shot. Mm. Yeah, I was while while you were talking, I was I was gonna say that that's my my favorite shot. Uh, this is absolutely incredible. And just on that um, that shot of Damon, the the, the introduction um, in the throne room, you just you know everything about the character immediately. Um, the way he's shrouded behind, you know, when she's entering at first, you can't even really see him. You only know he's there because she addresses him. You know, it's he's sort of hiding in the throne. You know, sort of. Almost as if he's like hiding behind Viserys's power in a way, you know. And the way he just leans forward, sort of just exposing himself, it's yeah, it's it's great, great character sort of shooting. Um, so the next one is from Cherokad. Um, what are some of the challenges you had to face during the making of Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon? Well, I always, I always. <laughs> You know, I always feel, you know, I'm doing my dream job, right? The film industry is like this kind of strange industry where, I mean, I can't call it a job. You know, I love what I do. It's, it's like a passion that I've had since I've been 14. And, you know, so I, I, I'm very, very lucky and, 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 grateful for that and so i can't really call any of that a challenge 
it would make me feel bad if I call it a challenge. You know, obviously there can be tricky days where you have, you know, a lot to shoot, um, too much to shoot, where you have, you know, incredibly difficult weather conditions. It can be super cold. You know, Game of Thrones we had on on the dark night. You know, we had nights where it was we had 55 nights. You know, 55 consecutive nights. That's pretty full on. That was tough for the crew. Um, and we had nights where it was so cold that our gas lines that were making the fires froze, you know. So that was pretty tough, but still, you know, it's not a proper job. <laughs> it's a fun job. Um, the next one is coming from Anshuman. How did you feel about your true cinematography shining through in the Snyder Cut? And how do you feel about both versions? Wow. Well, to me, well, to me, there's only one version, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Zack Snyder version. That was the movie that we made. That was the movie that we shot. That was the movie that, you know, Zack always wanted to make. And it's a miracle. And I'm so grateful to the fans that he actually was able to show it in the end. Because none of us, and I know he, himself never thought that he would be able to show that film you know everything before that to me doesn't even exist it was just um, an atrocity <laughs> uh just on that real quick um so obviously the snyder cut is in a uh four three aspect ratio um that is a completely different story when you're shooting with something else you know the sort of standard uh, aspect ratios how how did you um you know because obviously like i said that makes a big difference when you're shooting the way you frame the characters you frame you frame faces everything's completely different so when you do the reshoots um i can i can only assume that's that's a big deal you sort of have to sort of work around all of that well i mean you know four by three used to be the the dominant version of making movies for mm. almost 50 years you know, some of the greatest films of all times are four three. So, you know, it's just that we got very much used to widescreen and then, you know, sixteen by nine and one to one eight five and all these different widescreen formats. Um Zach always wanted to shoot four three from the very beginning. And so what we did is but we had to protect for one eighty five cinema release, because that's what they wanted initially. So we we shot for that, but we always kept the four three in mind. Because that was always going to be Zach's sort of go-to go-to thing. Go-to thing. Um, what was the rest of the question? Sorry. Um, Just how how do you manage to sort of uh, you know work around that when you're doing the reshoots? Because yeah, so obviously you have a different director and I all didn't that. Do the reshoots. And oh, really? Okay. No, no. So I finished with Zach, and I didn't go back to the reshoots. Um, okay. You know, I was very committed to Zach's version and to Zach's vision of the film. And uh, when they were doing the reshoots, I mean, I guess I can, I can openly say they kind of disregarded this got, this everything that we had done anyway uh, on Zach's shoot. So, you know, they, yeah, I mean, there's no point even in talking about it. Hmm. It's so ridiculous. But I'm very happy that, you know, Zach's version came out. I'm very happy for Zach um, because he went through a very difficult time. Um, and yeah, of course, I was happy for myself to see the film that I, the way that I had shot it and intended to, you know, for it to be seen. So yeah, I think it's I think it's something very special seeing a superhero film. Um, in a four three aspect ratio because you you you're playing with a different a feeling you have a lot of verticality there you know um if you're using a sort of standard aspect ratio with black bars blocking out most of the screen on most of the screen i'm lying but a lot of the screen you know it's it's a big difference you know you have the sort of and i think i i wish we saw that we see that more in superhero films because i think for action you can really do a lot of very dynamic shots you know, I, I think it's a very, very interesting way of yeah, shooting maybe things. Maybe we'll see that in Venom Free. 
because um <laughs> I couldn't comment. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Um... Okay, so this one is from Sebastian. Um, which other cinematographers have ex in inspired you? Uh, and if you weren't a cinematographer, um, what would have been a career that you would have pursued and liked just as much? I mean, on the cinematographer's note, I just think there's too many, you know, there's so many amazing DP, there's so many amazing cinematographers. You know, it's hard to pick one, and obviously you always sort of have to go to people like Dick, Roger Dickens and Chivo, you know, and Bob Richardson, who are obviously amazing, you know, but there's, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds, and, you know, Chris Doyle is probably one of my, he's made some of my favorite films, um, you know, but there's so many, so I, 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 would, I, I don't think I could put a name to it, because it's the same with like favorite film. There's an, I couldn't put a name to a favorite film as such. Um, what do I do? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I wanted to do this since I was like 12, 13. Um, I don't know. I guess at some point I thought about archaeology, which I'm glad I didn't do that. <laughs> That was only because I loved Indiana Jones, obviously. Um, I really don't know. I, 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 I have no idea. I enjoy making things these days. I enjoy building little things, you know, in the garden. But um, I couldn't make any money with that, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the very last question of today is coming from Alex Hendry. Where was your favorite location to film for Game of Thrones or House of the Dragon? Hmm. Well, it would definitely be Game of, uh, Game of Thrones because House of Dragon was <clears throat> very much based in the studio. And then we were, in, I mean, yeah, we were in Spain and Portugal. We were House of Dragon, we were shooting up on um, this amazing mountain, I forgot the name now. And we went there for the wreck, and it was this amazing, beautiful day. And you could see like for hundreds of miles in every direction. Was it for the funeral? For the wedding. For the wedding. When Matt marries ah. Ranira. And uh, it was this beautiful place, you know, and it was really hard to get up there. Super tricky for the crew. And uh, and we planned it all and then we got there on the day of the shooting and it was so misty and cloudy that you couldn't see. I literally couldn't see my own hand. <laughs> uh, so that was pretty weird. Um, do, do you have any funny yeah. stories from, from, from set or something where you had, you know, just like you were saying, you didn't see anything, some complications that turned out to be funny? You know, I think there's things, there's, those kind of things happen every single day. <laughs> there's always there's always things happening by chance, and, and and something funny happens. You know, you know, you try and you know, you try and have fun on set. You know, while you're working hard, and I think you know, you're surrounded by an interesting bunch of people, and you know, it's it's a very it's that kind of environment. You know, locations was I think Game of Thrones was you know interesting because we went to so many different places like Croatia, Spain, Morocco, you know, Iceland, you know, and I think, you know, you know, I love going to different places and, and, and exploring different landscapes and countryside and people and, you know, I think, you know, there was interesting, interesting bits in, in all of that, you know, I'd have to think really hard to sort of pick out one particular one. Um, it's difficult. We're very lucky to be going to all of those places. You know? Well, and then there's only one more thing to say. Thank you very much for joining us today, Fabian. I wish you the absolute best for the future. And maybe we will see you back in Westeros one way or another. So there's a couple of shows coming up. Um, will they do holidays there? <laughs> 
then I'll definitely go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for, for watching, for listening. Take care and see us later. Thanks, guys. Thank you.